the Laplace transformation is one of the most handy tools to describe electrical circuits with AC signals. It reminds quite a lot of the Fourier series that we have looked into further. But compared to the Fourier series, it is not limited to periodic functions as we are integrating all the way from zero to infinity. Furthermore, in the Laplace transformation, we are multiplying the original function in the time domain, ft here, with an exponential function, where its uh, argument of the exponential function is minus the complex frequency s multiplied with the time t. We integrate over t, and then we get the same function in the frequency domain, which is represented by a uppercase letter and an underscore indicating that it's complex and again we have the complex frequency s the complex frequency s with an underscore has a real part sigma plus j omega where omega is the angular frequency very often sigma is just simply put to zero and i cannot explain what the real part of a frequency is as I cannot explain what the imaginary part of time is. Now the Laplace transformation is of such great importance that it got its own mathematical symbol represented up here, where an empty circle in the time domain side is connected to a solid circle in the frequency domain side. We also call the lowercase ft the function in the time domain, and the uppercase f with the underscore, the function in the frequency domain. Furthermore, you would also very often hear the term frequency for the complex frequency s, which is not to be confused with the frequency f, where omega is 2 times pi times the frequency f. If you want to drill deeper into the mathematical background and how you can apply the Laplace transformation, I can suggest you to read that journal paper from an IEEE journal, which is using the Laplace transformation in electrical circuits, but it's also applying the Laplace transformation to a mechanical problem, which is the dampening of a car suspension. Afterwards, that paper is turning its attention to a specific problem of the Laplace transformation towards the limits when we are approaching zero and infinity. Now using this integral up here helps us to get from the time domain to the frequency domain. And the inverse Laplace transformation is helping us to go the other way. If we have a function in the frequency domain, we can do, apply the inverse Laplace transformation to go back into the time domain. Here we multiplied the function in the frequency domain with e powered by the frequency, the complex frequency times time t and integrate over the complex frequency ds where the integral starts at minus j infinity and goes all the way to plus j infinity where alpha again is the real part of the frequency which is typically zero. Finally, we divide by two times pi times the imaginary number. Now the limits of a function in the time domain when the time approaches zero from the right hand side is equal to the limit of the same function in the frequency domain multiplied with the complex frequency where s, the complex frequency, approaches infinity. And the other way around, if t approaches infinity, so that is for example for DC signals, which are constant all the way until infinity, you would approach zero frequency of the limit of the function in the frequency domain, again multiplied with the complex frequency. Now that's the mathematical background to switch between time domain and frequency domain. And we will apply that a lot to the electrical circuits.
But before we can do that, we need to know the rules, how we can apply the Laplace transformation in both domains. Therefore, let's have a look first at the mathematical properties of the Laplace transformation. In the time domain, the independent parameter, the independent variable is the time. So you have the time on the x-axis, you start typically at zero, and then you go all the way to infinity or to whatever value you are interested in. And t is the running parameter, t is the parameter you are changing along the way. And the frequency domain, you are changing the complex frequency s, which is typically reduced to j omega. So what you're actually sweeping is the frequency omega. You sweep f, which you can scale with 2 pi, which then gets omega. And if you multiply it with j, you are at s, again, ignoring the real part of the frequency. If you want to represent a signal in the time domain, you plot it on the y-axis. The function, for example, the voltage or the current on the y-axis, whereas the time is on the x-axis. And similarly, you would plot the signal in the frequency domain as a complex signal versus the complex frequency, which is the independent variable. Another mathematical property called linearity helps us to superimpose signals. If we, for example, have two voltages that we are adding up on top of each other, and they might get scaled by different amplitudes, we can do that in the time domain, and we can do exact the same operation in the frequency domain. That would be very helpful for Kirchhoff's voltage law. And the same for Kirchhoff's current law, if F1 and F2 are currents here, and you have a node where both of those currents are flowing into, then you just can simply superimpose them both in the time domain and in the frequency domain. Now, when we looked at inductors and capacitors, we already met the integration of variables. So the integration and the differentiation which is the counterpart of it, are also very handy properties of the Laplace transformation. If we integrate in the time domain from zero until t over a function f, and here I changed the independent variable into tau because we are integrating over that variable tau until t, then we end up with the division when the frequency domain, we simply divide by the complex frequency s. We have already seen that property when we use j omega, for example, at a capacitor that is integrating the current flowing through it. We integrate that current in the time domain, which ended up being a division by j omega in the frequency domain, and as a result, we got the voltage across that capacitor. The differentiation in the time domain leads to the multiplication in the frequency domain with the complex frequency s. But here we also need to take the starting value, the initial value of the function, into account. So the value of the function in the time domain at time zero, and here I'm writing zero s, where the s stands for seconds, it doesn't have an underscore, so that's the unit at zero seconds, is getting multiplied with the Dirac function. Now a Dirac impulse, which is often abbreviated as a delta, delta as the function of t, t standing for time, is a very narrow pulse with zero widths, an infinite height, and the area under that impulse is actually one. That's the definition of the direct impulse. If we integrate the direct impulse, we end up with the function called the step function. So we integrate from zero until infinity over time. And if we integrate over time, we multiply also with, uh, with seconds. So the unit from the direct impulse, which is in Hertz, is getting eliminated here, and we end up with the unit of one for the so-called unity step. Again, the direct impulse is one hertz at the time zero seconds, 
and zero at all other times. And the unity step function is one for everything above and equal to zero seconds and is zero before the time zero. Now we differentiate it once. We can certainly differentiate the differentiation. So that would be a differentiation of twice of the original signal in the time domain. Therefore, we multiply the signal in the frequency domain twice with the complex frequency. We have the leftovers from the initial value from the first differentiation, which got multiplied here with the direct impulse, which now also gets multiplied with the complex frequency S. And we have a new initial value that we subtract again and multiply with the direct impulse. We can offset any function in the frequency domain with an arbitrary factor of alpha. So we can just move a signal around in the frequency domain to the left or right of the x-axis, which again is the frequency axis with that factor of alpha. And that would show up in the time domain as a multiplication with an exponential function where the argument of the exponential function is minus that alpha times the time t, which is the independent variable over here. And finally multiplied with the function in the time domain. Equally, we can shift a signal in the time domain by just offsetting it here, for example, with the factor minus beta. Then we also need to offset the unity step with the same factor of minus beta and equally to what applied with the offset in the frequency domain, where the offset in the frequency domain led to a multiplication with an exponential function in the time domain. It's now the other way around. The offset in the time domain is giving us a multiplication in the frequency domain with the exponential function having the arguments of the minus offset times the independent variable over here, which is the complex frequency. And then furthermore, we multiply with the signal in the frequency domain. Now that was the math and some of the rules derived from the math of the Laplace transformation. But we engineers, we wanna apply it. We wanna use it. We wanna use that to describe our circuits. And it's a rather short recipe here. We got four steps, sometimes only three steps. So you describe your circuit analytically just by using Kirchhoff's rules or Ohm's law. Maybe you want to do some Thevenin or Norton equivalents and transfer some sources, a voltage source into a current source or vice versa to simplify the analysis of the circuit. You can do that already in the frequency domain. You don't need to uh, transfer it from the time domain in the frequency domain. All that can be done as we did with the phasers, where we multiplied with J omega or divided with J omega. Now it's just S instead of J omega. In the second step, you apply all the relevant signals. Typically, it's the sources. So if you have one or two voltage sources, which are superimposed in a circuit, you apply all of those, you superimpose them if necessary, and then you have your results already in the frequency domain just by simply multiplying, dividing, adding, or subtracting, where you would have to solve differential equations in the time domain. We will have a special look at that when we look at transfer functions which is the next part of the course. If you wanna go back and see what happens in the time domain from the stimulus that the system is getting from the sources that you applied, for example, steps or the direct impulses, you can apply the inverse Laplace transformation and have a look at what the system is doing in the time domain based on those stimuli. Very often, once you get used to the S domain, to the frequency domain, you would stop your analysis here and already interpret the results, plot the results, or let the computers do the numerical calculations.
and see how the results of a circuit analysis look like in step three. Now for independent or uncontrolled sources, what we used to call sources, which can be mathematically described as a function in the time domain, can be simply transferred into the frequency domain by the Laplace transformation for voltages and also for currents. If you have a controlled source, then one source would be dependent on another parameter. In this case, I'm showing it with voltages and currents. And a voltage controlled voltage source would be representing an operational amplifier, for example. You would have the difference between the inverting and the non-inverting input getting multiplied by the gain mu of that operational amplifier. And you get the output voltage V2 in the time domain. And exactly the same applies in the frequency domain, just that we are now writing uppercase letters and adding the underscores. A bipolar transistor is controlled by its base current which is I1 here, and the controlled parameter is the collector emitter current. You call beta the current gain of a bipolar transistor, and again, exactly the same happens in the frequency domain. You're just rewriting it with complex numbers. The proportional factor in a trans impedance amplifier is a resistance R, and again, you rewrite the exact same thing in the frequency domain. For a MOSFET, you have the independent parameter being the gate source voltage, and you control the drain current with that one, and the gain between those two is the so-called GM value, or the transconductance of a MOSFET. And again, you just simply transfer those signals over to the frequency domain. Now we've talked about voltages and currents. Let's have a look at some specific signals that often occur in electrical circuits. We spoke already about the direct impulse, which is one hertz in the frequency domain. You can also have a direct impulse actually in the frequency domain, which would be one second in the time domain. And then actually it looks exactly the same in the time and in the frequency domain, it's always an impulse with zero width and infinite height. And the only thing that changes is basically the unit. If we integrate the direct impulse once over time, we end up with the unity step, which transfers into the frequency domain as one over the complex frequency S. This is one of the most widely seen transformations from the Laplace transformation. You very often use a unity step to stimulate a signal, something that is zero, has initial conditions, and then you put a unity jump on that, a unity step, and see what happens. A very simple example for that would be you put your mobile phone into the charger. You didn't have any voltage across the connector to begin with and then you have a jump you jump up to the charging voltage and the battery starts charging and that would be actually modeled by a unity step another signal that could occur here and there is a unity ramp so we basically integrate the unity step once more and in the frequency domain we end up with one over the complex frequency squared Now applying the principle of an offset of the independent parameter into a unity step here, we can see by offsetting the frequency with the factor of alpha, so just adding alpha here to our complex frequency, which is the result of the unity step, we get back to the mathematical property in the time domain, which is simply an exponential function. If we then Further on, multiply that in the time domain with the time t and also apply the unity step to that, we would square the result in the frequency domain. 
turning on a sine wave at time zero and then let it oscillate all the way until infinity with the specific frequency beta turns into beta divided by the complex frequency squared plus beta squared here. Now we have two frequencies here. Beta is a one very specific frequency. For example, from the grid, could be 50 hertz, could be 60 hertz. And S, the complex frequency, often also very called frequency, as we're just speaking about frequency domain, is the one that is actually the independent variable. So over here in the time domain, it was time running from zero until infinity. And over here, we have the complex frequency S running from zero to infinity, but we applied it to a signal that has a very specific repetition rate of, for example, 50 or 60 Hertz in the time domain. Now to get from a sine wave to a cosine wave in the time domain, we need to take the derivative of the sine wave and that will be a multiplication in the frequency domain with, with the complex frequency. And then we would also need to take the derivative of the argument and that's where the beta in the numerator disappears here in the frequency domain and the denominator stays exactly the same as we have from the sine wave. And practically a very relevant signal can be also a dampened sine wave. So the, the multiplication of an exponential function with the sine wave or the multiplication of an exponential function with the cosine wave which would transfer into those two cases in the frequency domain over here.